the association agreement that the Ukrainians were fighting for in so-called Euromaidan in 2014, we had signed it, it, it already in 1995. So, so many years uh, before that, 19 years uh, before that. And this is a huge success of our societies looking back because this is, was really a defining moment for us. Uh, and it was because Russia was still weak, we managed to do that. Uh, we worked hard, we were courageously moving forward. So these formats are extremely valuable for us. And uh, just as you, Ambassador, mentioned, we are increasingly finding them more and more important to see in comparison between the vulnerabilities that uh, Ukrainians and Georgians are facing and uh, we are facing. And there I really agree uh, to the analysis that I think that Putin probably, if he had an opportunity, he would probably use an opportunity towards the Baltic states, but in general he probably has accepted that we are wrong. So these formats are very important for us, and I really agree to what Jana said about the comparison between NATO and the European Union. Uh, my feeling very much, and also from the rather optimistic note of the first panel, is that uh, NATO has actually uh, been able to prove successful and successfully responding. And this was mentioned in many speeches uh, uh, already. Those Balls and Warsaw summits, uh, NATO has even managed to enlarge, including Montenegro, which is a whole story on its own right. But the really fragile link is the European Union now. And I agree to the analysis that um, Russia is trying to do everything possible to show that the European is weak, that it has stopped believing in its own success, uh, that countries are not uh, benefiting from the membership, and so on and so forth. And we see this in uh, uh, the uh, information space uh, that is, uh, that is uh, transmitted uh, also to our population from, uh, uh, from uh, over the border from Russia. And here I think this is a very important as aspect that we have to remember, that the European project is indeed very fragile, we are still expecting the result of the French election, and it will be the defining election. Of course, the whole Brexit uh, project and the fragilities have been uh, mentioned there. Uh, one last thing that I would like to mention is about Russia, because uh, indeed uh, there has been a lot of uh, analysis done on Russia. But what we have agreed in the Latvian parliament is that in our public speaking and in our thinking, we will very clearly differentiate between the official Russia and the official Putin's Russia and the Russian people and civil society. Because we see that Russia has these internal vulnerabilities and the civil society of Russia, they really need the support. They need to know that we see them. And this is very important. And for this reason, in Latvian Parliament, we established a uh, cooperation group uh, of the Latvian members of Parliament with the opposition uh, parties and civil society of Russia. And we try to engage in a permanent dialogue just to make sure that those people who oppose the Putin regime, and uh, during the protests, uh, recent protests in Russia, we saw that there are plenty of those, and actually many of the younger generation joined that they hear that the support is there. So these are just a few remarks from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dear <laughs> panelists, uh, you uh, are privileged in that sense that uh, I give you a chance to comment or if you have any additional thoughts or, or ideas to express them, you can do it now very shortly uh, before I open up just maybe one remark um, on, on, on NATO and Trump and the German fear of maybe my fear, I'm not uh, allowed to speak for, for um, my country officially, but maybe my fear as a German is not so much, I mean, you're right, I mean, there are brilliant people around Donald Trump, um, people um, who know Russia, who are transatlanticists um, forever, but what would I am questioning is just um, how much influence they really have um, when the president wakes up one moment and decides to do something differently. And that is something, I mean, it would be nice, and I, I hear that all the time, that the 
people around Donald Trump will guarantee that he does the right thing. And I hear all the time that if we would all spend 2%, then it would be just fine. But what I'm wondering is just what if Donald Trump wakes up uh, one morning and decides to um, change his policy on Syria, like he did. I mean, he did, he did, he did change his policy on Syria overnight, um, uh, and, 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 <laughs> over, over a cake. Um, and what if we um, will then uh, reach a scenario like Iraq 2003, where half Europe is on one side and the other half is on the other side, and it comes exactly, the dividing line will be uh, maybe between, like back then, old and new Europe, and maybe then in this region also, in this Baltic Sea region, also a very crucial divide. And this is just, my theory is not, um, I would really wish that all goes right and well, but it's just the um, unpredictability and the uncertainty I'm worried about. And um, I think that is already harming NATO a great deal. Well, some analysts said that uh, Putin has lost the monopoly over unpredictability now. <laughs> That's good. My reaction, you know, when, when, when we hear these remarks, you know, about, about uh, Trump, you know, it's, it's okay. You know, of course, he's very, you know, uh, uh, formally, if you look from outside, he's very unpredictable. But we should not concentrate on Trump. We should concentrate on ourselves. And this is what we want Germany to concentrate on, Germany. We, we can need to go to, the, to the Washington together. Tillerson was part of the NATO ministerial meeting. So there are, uh, uh, Trump will be part of the NATO uh, summit in, 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 in two weeks' time. So there will be a lot of opportunities to engage with them. But we should do what we are about to do as a country. So that's why when, when we, Lithuania decided to invest more than 2%, and actually now our political elite Decide, decide to, to even open possibilities that we might invest in the future 2.5. This is not theory, but this might be in two years. We are doing this not for the, for the sake of Trump, to please Mr. Trump, but we thought this is good for the free defense, because we are threatened. We are uh, once again threatened, and this is, this is our important. So that's why you know, we can continue to discuss what this personality Trump is about, but more important to discuss what is our role to do for our country. And everyone else, maybe just uh, along these lines, I think it's important to remember that uh, our countries are not allies with individual leaders, whether it's Trump or Merkel or, or anyone else. They're, they're allies with each other as, as, as countries. So this is, is transcending any individual leader. Um, and at least in the, I understand the concerns with unpredictability, but at least in the case of the, the Syria decision, um, it wasn't just the, the famous piece of chocolate cake, um, it was actually, I think, the, the advice that he got from the, the advisors. <laughs> his daughter. His daughter, no, I think it was the, uh, also the military <laughs> advice uh, from his Secretary of Defense and the National Security Advisors and, and others. And, and in many ways, I think it was a decision that was more in the... Uh, you know, maybe the tradition of, of, of mainstream American foreign policy than much of what uh, people have been concerned yeah, about. Advice from the the and, and just one maybe final quick comment um, to follow up on the discussion that uh, that you had about are we safe now with the uh, um, these extra NATO deployments. Um, it, it might be appropriate to recall since the, the Adenauer Foundation is one of the supporters of, of this event that uh, back in the 1950s uh, Chancellor Adenauer was asked this question of uh, how many um, American troops or NATO troops do you need in West Germany to feel safe from a, a Soviet invasion? And the, the famous answer was one. Uh, one. Uh, one dead yeah. perhaps. Uh, but uh, again, it's an idea of a tripwire. But it, it would also be important not to, in, in part to remember that, uh, but also not to draw the wrong historical lesson, as the, the first panel would, would put it. That this was one or more than one uh, American troop there, but backed up by a uh, an ability to, to resupply troops, to, to deploy quickly uh, more troops to, to Europe, um, and that you had kind of the logistical and legal capacity to do that. So it's, um, again, I think we can take a certain amount of, of confidence in, in, uh, that this tripwire will be taken seriously, but uh, we also need to make sure it's, it's backed up um, by additional capabilities. Mike. Right. Well, if we start with the historical stuff, or if you continue with the historical stuff, I, I would say actually that 
this current relationship and, and the fears of Trump and so on are very pale if you compare it with the real crisis that we have had in only the last 40 years or so. We had the Vietnam War. I mean, that was a major thing in terms of transatlantic divisions. We had the Eurovision crisis in the 80s where, at least as it was seen from here, half of West Germany was marching on the streets every weekend for, for a number of years, demonstrating against the United States, against the United States, against NATO, and against the entire idea of deterrence against the Soviet Union. That was a major thing as well. And then, of course, we had the, the, um, uh, the uh, invasion of Iraq in 2003, which also divided Europe very heavily, as you said, in terms of of this. So uh, the Trump administration <laughs> simply hasn't had time yet to create a crisis of that magnitude <laughs> They might be able to, but again, the United States is not North Korea. It, the change of a leader does not mean that he decides everything on his own. And, and that's kind of a major takeaway <coughs> from my own ana analysis of, of the kind of things here. So uh, I think we, we need to keep this in mind, the historical perspective and the fact that uh, you know, the United States is a huge bureaucracy in terms of defense and security. It takes a lot of time to change things, and uh, that is, in that sense, good for us with a, sort of an impulsive, as it seems at least, present. So uh, I think that the, the fears that we can um, you know, be justified in having right now, looking at his tweets in particular, I'm a big fan of Twitter, so, so I, I see that this is a clear case of what happens when you do a lot of tweeting, essentially. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't think that this is the real big story so far. Thank you, and I would like to open up the floor for questions. We have ten minutes. Um, <laughs> 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 My name is Ditte Rietuma. And uh, I'm both Latvian and Swedish. And I have a master's degree in economy, and I'm a scientist. I've been uh, working very long preparing for this third world war of Federal Reserve Bank. And uh, I find your uh, paradigm of discussion very narrow, isn't it? What do you think? Well, it's up to you to decide. Yeah. <laughs> Keep your questions short, please. So, um, when we I've returned to Latvia because the genocide is going on there, which is committed by a financial system. And there is no independence there, because there are only foreign banks. And by the definition of state, it cannot exist if there are only foreign banks. It's nothing else. It's not independent state. And <coughs> digitalization of the systems is quite a weapon, isn't it? Because I had to really come back here because it's impossible to live in Latvia. There is war going on. A million people have left Latvia just because foreign banks uh, take away credit cards for just little... Sorry, do you have a question? We really have only nine minutes. Do we want to stop the war, dear? Please, don't stop me. I, I, will, I will be ready in five minutes. What is your you question? See, you see, that you want war, don't you? Because I can't stop the war, I promise you. I have, I have the solution here. Here is the solution. We, uh, uh, we need some questions for the panelists. No, you don't want the solution. You want only a question. The panel that has a very narrow panel. And here we are. So, so, so that is our problem. So the solution is that here you have one trillion Baltic indigenous rules that Baltic indigenous people have emitted instead of Federal Reserve Bank that is doing its third world war to colonize the regions. And I would like to give it to your Juan Cito as And uh, we have criminalized all war systems, including banking system that is feeding this war. Thank you very much. I, I think we will take in, uh, the yeah, next no. question. Real parameters. How to stop. We had a question over there, and then one was over there. Sorry. 
I will try to be very, very short. Uh, my name is Ditis Malmatis. I work for UN Refugee Agency, their regional office here, which covers uh, five Nordic and three Baltic countries. Uh, I would like to say thank you to this panel and the panel before. It was very, very interesting and educating. Um, but I, I really missed one, I think, important component, and that is the issue of refugees. And uh, I'm not talking about uh, a refugee crisis in Europe, uh, etc. I'm talking about all these scenarios that we are discussing here, which I think in many cases would include people becoming refugees. Right. And I'll just uh, give you a, a quote from a Swedish newspaper, Dagens Industri, from last year, October. They wrote the following, that in case Russia attacks any of the Baltic states, about a million people would be on the move immediately. So the question is, are we ready for one million displaced people in this region? And if not, what should be done? Thank you. Who wants to take? I didn't get the answer on the digital money, please. How can you get us digital money when electricity can go out blank and we will die just without water, without resources? Uh, please ask we, we got your question. Thank you. Yes. Indeed, uh, indeed this, this issue of the resilience in, in, in specific uh, technical terms was part of the NATO decision in Warsaw. NATO in Warsaw last year agreed on seven NATO baseline resilience requirements, which include uh, the mass movement of population, dealing with, uh, dealing with uh, communication lines, electricity. Why? Because NATO understood that even for the military operations, all the civilian assets becoming critical. Uh, look to our countries, and here I, I would agree with a, with, a, with a lady raising this issue. Our Sweden, Lithuania to less extent, but Sweden, many other countries, we have our money stored in, in digital form. Uh, there are, compared with the Cold War period when many communication lines line were government owned, there was some probability that government might keep these lines open during the crisis. Now many of uh, in Lithuania, all mobile phone companies are Swedish or Danish. This is okay, but uh, I mean, we as a government have less control as far as, again, resilience, their preparedness. So this also makes us uh, more vulnerable, but also it, may, it push governments, uh, as far as the NATO resilience requirements, to open the dialogue with the private companies, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, foreign investors, because the world has changed and we cannot now dream of coming back to the Cold War period where everything was controlled by the government. So this openness uh, of uh, which I was mentioning is becoming our weakest. But we should not panic. We should rather start to think how to respond to, 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 the, new, to the new realities. And this is what uh, I think this is the biggest, uh, biggest challenges. But uh, it's, that's why it's important to continue cooperation with our countries. On the refugee issue, I mean, uh, we're not, of course, prepared to take on any form of contingency of that scale. And the entire point of what we're trying to do right now is, of course, to avoid that situation through containment and deterrence. I mean, that's the entire basic point of, of uh, the efforts of all governments in this field. And some ways are better than others, of course. I mean, the, Joining NATO for Sweden and Finland, for example, would be a much better thing than what the governments currently are doing, but that will count in, in the long term. Uh, one question. Uh, my name is Per Felinius, and uh, as a Swedish citizen, I don't know what to do. Action or no action. <laughs> when I listen to our government, they said, don't worry, we have a plan. In 10 years' time, we will have the defense. <laughs> we have a Swedish expression called long war. Uh, my question is now, to get me and all the clever people who should be able to help with the defense, to help with the internet, and to get involved, we must feel a threat. 
we must understand if there is threat now. If we were told that put the plan to borrow Gotland in September, and he will tell the people in Sweden that don't worry, we will not interfere, we just need this for strategical reason. Then, when we feel a threat, then it's a completely different question to get the right money, to get the right people. So my question is, is that a threat? Is it possible that he wants to borrow Gotland in September? <coughs> the second question is, if there is a threat, what are you going to do to get us all involved, to defend us? Thank you. Do you want to take it? Okay, I'll try to answer it very simply. If there, is, if there is a serious crisis or even a war in the Baltic Sea region, Putin most certainly would like to borrow a block lighter. So that is a vital, let's call it a piece of territory in this part of the world. Then, the second part of your question is a bit more complicated, but if I might describe the Swedish mentality at the moment, why are they not doing more? We should do a lot more at the moment, very much more. Just compare with other countries in our vicinity are doing. Is that we intellectually have accepted that there is an increased tension in our region due to Russia's actions. But somehow we can't accept the thought that we might be attacked. So it's some kind of split thinking in Sweden, to my mind. Would you buy a complete place and put it in Auckland in a short time from US or from England or from France? Other countries they can buy a base tomorrow to have a quick defense? I doubt that anyone would like to allocate resources to Gotland because it's so obviously a Swedish problem. Or to be really practical, the Germans don't have any resources, the French don't have any, the British don't have any. So in the end, okay, if you can persuade the Americans to put something on Gotland, I don't know. Indigenous have. We can give. So, but the obvious, it's so obvious. We should do something about Gotland ourselves. And what we are doing at the moment is just what you might call a tripwire. It's not going to defend the island. Thank you. I'm going to take one last question back there. <laughs> So, uh, thank you very much for sharing your confidence. Um, my name is Yuvata Kanna, political scientist. Um, I have a question regarding the EU in this area. So, does the EU, through perhaps the CSDP, have a role to play in the future of the security of the Baltic Sea region? Or is the CSDP obsolete and it's the NATO's problem? I think, um, especially the German and the French, or the current French government, um, try to do everything to show that um, CSDP is not obsolete, and or if it was obsolete, like Donald Trump said, now um, it shouldn't be obsolete any longer. Um, the problem I see with CSDP um, in a European context is that every European member state uh, understands it differently when it comes out of when it comes to CSDP. And every member state expects different things from an enhanced uh, European um, defense activity. The French, for example, I think, think about more um, interventions in Africa. Um, the Germans, I think, think about CSDP already in institutions and as a political project, not so much um, thinking about concrete missions. Um, uh, Poland and the Baltic states actually, I, I think, would like to see also more um, 
not not uh, um, um, not in opposition to NATO, but maybe um, something combined. But the thing is, what where I see CSDP heading at the moment is more. Um, uh, crisis management, um, or and, and civilian crisis management, uh, management or a military crisis management, but not territorial defense at the moment. So I see it more as a tool, for example, to do something in Africa or to do something in the Mediterranean where NATO cannot be um, active for whatever reasons or where <coughs> the EU should play a great role. I don't see that debate on territorial defense very present in the EU at the moment. Right. I would say that it has never been an actor in the field of territorial defense and was never designed for it as well, as I said earlier. And the key issue though for the EU here in this region could be that given the big civilian um, kind of abilities and resources of the EU, it could have a role in, in uh, what the Tudas was discussing about hybrid warfare and resilience and, and civil emergency stuff and that kind of thing. But that requires a nice, well thought through kind of division of labor between the EU and NATO, and that has been going on for a while, but is politically sensitive in some countries, France in particular, I would say. So, so we see the solution, but uh, for political reasons, it's very difficult to get through to, to a good kind of balance here. Indeed, uh, very briefly, uh, Baltic and probably Polish red line is that in CSDP, you cannot play the duplicate NATO. This is what uh, cannot duplicate NATO. But what uh, what uh, uh, what, uh, what uh, uh, Mike was saying about about this uh, EU contribution to all other possible scenarios, including hybrid, this is very relevant. This way, EU is much have more bigger competence and energy resilience or, or, or civilian unrest. So this is EU have more competence. NATO have more competence how to combat external wars. You have more confidence. So here I definitely see potential if, if Germany and France will go alongside this line that we our countries will support this. Yes, uh, from our perspective also, uh, uh, CSDP definitely has some additional potential that still needs to be developed. Uh, but it should not definitely run counter to what NATO does. And ideas about, for instance, closer cooperation in uh, the military procurement are very good ideas and definitely uh, can be supported. But I think that we should not should not take uh, the potential of uh, de developing uh, CSDP uh, for an idea that there, this might be the grand uh, project of the European integration that would save uh, uh, European uh, Union from uh, from the problems. It shouldn't because obviously this uh, uh, the defense direction. Uh, should not be one that we would be looking at as, as a grand project that will unite uh, all European Union member states that find difficulties. The problem is that we don't have any other project. I think that's the real problem we have. <laughs> that we should probably work on completely existing projects. <laughs> No. Uh, just to, to add to the discussion, it's, it's precisely in these uh, non-territorial defense issues that the NATO and the EU uh, have at least been committed to, to greater cooperation. Uh, you may recall that one of the, the outcomes of the Warsaw NATO summit last mm -hmm. summer was a special yeah. declaration on uh, enhanced uh, partnership between NATO and the EU institutionally, and uh, things like resilience, uh, things like organized crime, uh, things potentially even like uh, terrorism are, are areas where there may be more space for growth. So thank you all. I, I really want to thank the panelists. One of them has to leave right away and uh, please give them a great applause. You can, you can leave the stage if you wish and I'm going to invite here Mr. Going on soon up, some remarks. Uh, Mr. Björnman Sudov does not need any introduction in Sweden, I guess, but those who come from all the way countries, they, uh, he's the chairman of the Swedish Defence Commission, uh, a long time politician, a former defence minister. And, uh, and actually, I would like to share a little memory of you. You have no idea who I am, but I have one of these thousands of students who have actually uh, 
who has actually attended your lecture in 2002 uh, when I was finishing my master's degree at Stockholm University. And you were the Minister of Defence at that time. And you came in, I think it was a spring day for a lecture, and, uh, and you came with the news that the Baltic states have just been invited to, enjoy, uh, to join NATO. And you were very happy about it, saying that finally we can skip the responsibility. Well, I cannot keep you that satisfaction because we are so intertwined, but, but this is a nice memory. Though. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy that I have been invited to, on, uh, to this conference here, <laughs> here in Stockholm. And uh, on the closing remarks, I have been thinking about what we would be a kind of closing remarks. <coughs> Listen to the discussion, of course. And um, I think, uh, and I decided upon sitting here with you, that I should take use of the opportunity to bring up uh, about the sometimes uh, formulated, sometimes not formulated question. What does Sweden do on all these challenges? And some of the, uh, the panelists have given their answers and I will contribute with mine. And um, as, as you re referred to, for us the uh, freedom of Baltic countries and Poland and the integration by DDR into the Bundesrepublik, they have been an enormous enhancements of the security of Sweden. We must remember that the border between East and West was Western to the Skåneland. It was at Lübeck, and quite West to the border of Sweden. So it was a tremendous change to the better. Then the three Baltic countries had turned out by all international scrutinists to be genuine democracies. Some of the neighbors have run into troubles. I won't go into that. But the smallest in population, those with the relatively <coughs> longest borderline the Russian Federation have turned out to be the most, most full-fledged democracies in the aftermath of the Soviet Union. So that is very inspiring. And um, I would say that um, the way you have handled the minority issues is in concordance with the Council of Europe and the court in Strasbourg, how they, in that diligent way, are paying observance to the law, laws of, right of laws in every uh, European country. I will now turn to what is my view on the situation. It has, of course, been challenged by Russian Federation. And uh, my, my own view is that what's now going on under the auspices of performance of NATO has definitely improved the situation for the three countries. Uh, the Russian decision makers must take into consideration that a military intrusion or pre pre prepared preparations with non-military operations will Struck, strike the heart of, the, of NATO, including the big powers, the nuclear weapons ahead. That is United States, United Kingdom and France. That must be taken into consideration by Moscow. I am also of the view that the policy should be, be described as containment, deterrence, but also an ongoing um, realpolitische dialogue with, with the Russian Federation. I think these are vital elements taken, outlined, one can say, by George Kennan 
20, now 1947 and on, and it is still to be worked against uh, an, an authoritarian regime like the one in Russia Federation. I would now go to what can be demanded of, from Sweden. I know that the Swedish speaking here of you read Douglas Nyheter yesterday, yeah. and it was a reportage from Gotland where an American four-star general, General Perkins, was an invited guest. He disclosed that in the upcoming military exercise Aurora, there will be deployment of about 1,000 American soldiers on Gotland and in the areas around. Allow me to, to translate some of these uh, views. Gotland is like an unsinkable carrier in the middle of the Baltic Sea. That the captain on that ship is our good friend Sweden is a great need uh, for, for us. It would be an enormous loss if Sweden did not control Gotland. You cannot overstate the status, importance of Gotland in military, economic and political terms. General Perkins tells. And the Prime Minister of Sweden and the Defence Minister of Sweden also brings the message that there will be, Gotland has the, that kind of status also for ourselves. So it is one of the most strategic um, targets of, of Swedish military defence and also civilian defence to keep up Swedish sovereignty on Gotland. And I think the American views are that with a non-Russian military occupation of Gotland, it will be very difficult for the Russians to intrude into any of the Baltic countries due to causes that General Carlos Nerectis has outlined in his contribution to the Royal Swedish Academy of War Sciences, that it will be he who controls Gotland will also control the air defense space for most of the southern Baltic Sea. So, my reaction here, reading the generals, what he says, the same wording by the Prime Minister and Defense Minister, is telling there are some very important things on the military and security fundamentals for the three Baltic countries. It, me being the presiding officer in the Defence Commission, we are studying and we are going to propose to the Swedish government, formally basically to all political parties in Parliament, the with strategies, the, uh, good, uh, the means and tools on the military and civil defence policies from nine, uh, 2020 till 2025 formally, but in reality for all the 2020s. I will not go into any details, but the work will be under two or three premises. One premise is that the majority of the political parties involved sitting in Parliament today they are in favour of increased budgets for the military and the civilian defence capabilities of Sweden. We are also uh, having a straight demand to study Gotland uh, and that will probably lead to that we foresee, predict and also propose enhanced in our armaments projections regarding Gotland and the surrounding territories in the air and at the sea. Secondly, there has been discussions with on the Swedish-Finnish relations. That is clear that we are not striving for an alliance in the sense that NATO, for instance, is, or in some instances one can argue the European Union is. And um, we are aware that small countries they have problems when they make alliances. You need a way of securing a kind of a backdoor support by one great power in the vicinity. We are perfectly aware of that. And the two bilateral, the two countries have 
two bilaterals with United States. And I think that the presence of the American general the other day shows that the new, the new administration basically will have the same view as the previous ones when that bilateral was signed with Sweden and also at one of the last days of the previous administration with Finland. And um, so in a sense we will enhance our cooperation with Finland we will definitely understand that the space for planning is Baltic Sea area and we will do that taking into account what can be understood, what can be substance in our two bilaterals with United States and the same goes with United Kingdom and we are also of course open for others but we understand that there has to be a big power, a great power, in a system, even if it is not outlined as a formal alliance. In our times, and also for previous times, you cannot be believe that small or even medium-sized countries can stand without, or in sometimes even against, um, um, big powers, especially uh, in a situation where they themselves found themselves in critical conditions, as were the case, for instance, in the Second World War. Ladies and gentlemen, I think there are very many positive uh, things to be viewed in a day like this, and one could perhaps discuss even more, in more positive terms what has really been achieved. I will not take, use my time for that, but I must tell you that I am of the view that what has occurred in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania are outstanding as trans transmissions from communist economic system, from communist authoritarian dictatorial system, from systems without rule of law, without real participation and without individual rights. It has been outstanding performed and uh, I hope that some of the neighbours in Eastern Europe who have also been freed from communism and from Russia can take the look for the good examples of how these three countries have evolved with their populations and even so, they have accepted that in legal ways um, get space, get money to implement their part of accepting refugees stemming to the European Union. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you very much for organizing this uh, conference. I would very much like to say that I have listened with great interest to what has been said today and I hope that in one way or another we can continue with this interaction. Thank you very much. Uh, dear friends, supporters, uh, speakers, moderators, I am very happy um, to say that this conference is a proof of networking, the result of networking. And uh, I would like to, to ask here also my partner, Markus Kolga from Canada. And as you see, there are new perspectives if we organize such kind of conferences, that this conference has been organized together. He's in Canada. And I am here in Stockholm, and we are doing it together. And at first, I would like to give you some words, because thank you very much, Markus, that um, we have this possibility to stream all this, 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 this wonderful discussions that people around the world could listen and watch us. Well, thank you, Sienna, for, for organizing this entire event. Um, and to the uh, Swedish-Estonian League for all of the advocacy work that you've been doing 
over the past years. I mean, you're a shining light uh, and an inspiration for all of us, especially your work on the Nord Stream case just uh, over the past 12 months. Um, I mean, we, we heard a lot of interesting information from the panelists. Our first panel um, let us know that there's, there's reason for optimism. The uh, advanced forward presence is, is coming up uh, in the Baltic Sea region. The second panel brought us back to Earth. They let us know that the threat has not disappeared. And I think it's conferences like these, and the work that you're doing, and the work that the Estonian communities and the Baltic communities around the world are doing, that's how we can push back. So thank you, Sibes, so much, and for everyone on your team for organizing this. I just want to say at the end that um, as uh, Ambassador Ilfüdas Bayaronas mentioned, that um, we have a role, how uh, this ethnical minority organizations in other countries, uh, we are like the censors, that if we feel that something is going wrong, then we have to have the courage to contact politicians and media, think tanks, and to, to um, uh, initiate the debates. And I'm really, really happy uh, that we managed to, um, last year in Almedalen, the political week, to, to make a campaign against the uh, Nord Stream. And it's also a courage. And um, knowledge, we need knowledge to write down, for example, five reasons why we don't want Russian gas. In, in the Baltic Sea. Why? There are so many reasons. And this is also important to explain common people in very easy words. Why? And as we have a long evening, uh, half of us uh, in, in front of us, I would like to thank once again um, Mario, uh, Estonian World Council, thank you for all the cooperation. Um, Leila, uh, who was actually the uh, initiator of this idea to organize the conference here in Stockholm when Estonian World Council is holding their uh, meeting here. And Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, uh, once again, we are very grateful. Um, the Polish embassy, the ambassador has already left, but uh, all our uh, thanks um, supporting us and uh, that NATO could support this, this uh, conference. And there is one person, and this is Anke schmidt <laughs> my good friend. And you need a lot of friends to, to make uh, this kind of conferences. Uh, some more practical information. Um, when we are now finishing here, uh, there will be time for questions if uh, some uh, uh, speakers and the moderators, uh, it's, it's only uh, Rina is here, to ask some questions. And all the other who want to continue, um, just go um, don't, don't, don't one floor and drop in here. First floor. Yeah, yeah. I think this way. Yeah, and we will um, continue networking. It's The bar is open there until uh, 7 o'clock. And the dinner, uh, these who has a dinner ticket, uh, the welcome drink, um, welcome drink will be served at uh, half past six, and it is only two floors down. Um, but if you leave the building in meanwhile, please don't come uh, in through the main entrance. Please use this one inside, um, which is um, uh, in north side, the smaller entrance. Have I forgotten something? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so,
thank you very much that you could come here on Saturdays and um, let's keep contact. Thank you.